and get started. So last week we took a, a view of how systems are built and what are the small fundamental parts of systems, what systems designers did, what data designers did, and we got into the real nitty-gritty. Uh, we're going to take a bigger view this week at uh, a larger picture of how all of this starts to come together. So we're going to cover macro systems. And uh, what are some examples of macro systems? So the, if your characters level up in an RPG action game or other kind of game with leveling up, many, many games have this, uh, that's a macro system because it's carrying from instance to instance, level to level, battle to battle, race to race, uh, planet to planet, whatever your measure of unit of uh, gameplay is in your kind of game, as the player levels up, uh, that persists and that's what's considered a macro system. Same thing with uh, character inventory that carries over if you collect things and use them later on, crafting and whatnot. Uh, achievements are one of the most classic uh, now and standardized macro systems is how do you dole out achievements through the game. You don't want to have all your achievements right up front. You don't want to have them all just at the end. Uh, you don't want to have a glut of them or a big ex uh, space where there are no achievements. And how you lay those out and plan them is uh, a, a macro system. Same with story progression. Uh, again, you want to have nice pacing and doling out your story when the player gets to correct points in time or space to give them the story. And that needs to be planned from a higher level view. Just not You don't come up with that on the fly as you're making small instances. Uh, stat increases is another good example of it. We want the player to have the right amount of challenge in the right place. Money, obviously, and other economic systems. If your game has an economy, whether it's an MMO or it's uh, saving up jewels to buy uh, a new level. It's, uh, it's an economic system, and those cover large areas, uh, and often the whole game. Uh, game level progression as well. So if you have games where you unlock new levels, whether that's a, a game like Cut the Rope where you have to earn stars by performing tasks to, to unlock new levels to play, or it's a game with a hub uh, where you unlock new levels to, to be able to go an adventure in, or like an MMO where there are different instances that you want to play in and you have to earn the right to go to there. That's a macro system of progression. And similarly with skill trees and other systems like that, we have to take a, a long view approach uh, to make sure the game as a whole is working cohesively. So how do we get the game balanced just right? I really like this picture. I think it's very illustrative of getting an entire game balanced right. On the one side, you have frustration. That's, you know, the big malevolent, uh, omniscient uh, creator. That's us, the designer. Uh, in, in our case, and players can get frustrated by us if we make things too hard and we balance it too much to our side. Uh, on the other hand, if we give too much to the player, they get bored. Uh, the fun bit is that little bit of gap right in between, and I think this, this painting illustrates that very well because one of the most interesting things about this painting is that little gap between their fingers. If their fingers were touching or if they were further apart, this, would not, this painting wouldn't be as well known. Uh, it's that little gap of just not quite connecting that makes things interesting. How do we illustrate this for a game? This is your target area. So imagine this in any other thing you're doing. Of Get a little bit too far in one direction, nope, it's ruined. A little bit too far in the other direction, nope, it's ruined. you got to run that knife's edge, and that's what we call fun. Then, uh, so to get the players there is very difficult and it uh, takes uh, a lot of adjustment both uh, as we set things up and then as we progress through the game. So there are two methods to get the uh, game as a whole in imbalance. Uh, one is top down and the other is bottom up. And there are a couple uh, different distinctions we're going to cover here. Uh, top down is where you know what you want and then you have to figure out a method of, of getting there. Uh, and then bottom up is you know kind of what's going on and now you need to make the system work with it. Uh, and there are different reasons you would use these. In general, I prefer top down. 
Uh, I think bottom up is usually what is, it's damage control. Uh, you know, you have an entire game made, all the levels are made, all the monsters are made, and you find out, oh my goodness, we have no way to balance this game. It's all over the place. So, okay, here's what we got. Now what do we do with it? Uh, other games, like very story-based games, like we know the story must progress the way they did in the book or it did in the movie. All right, so now how do we build an, uh, a cohesive game experience out of what is already known of that progression? All right, so that's, that's uh, bottom up. Top down means we know we want, uh, we have the staff to make 20 levels. Uh, so we're going to make 20 levels for the player to play in. And we want the game to take uh, 15 hours. And at the end, we want the player uh, to be level 100. So, you know, we don't even know the game yet. We just know uh, some high-level goals. And now we need to make some systems so that all of our small parts of the game, uh, every combat scenario, every puzzle, every uh, uh, level, every geometric level in it uh, fulfills its part in that larger whole, uh, right? So if we don't have good... Uh, a good plan uh, the, at the very beginning, then all of the parts most certainly will not sum up what, uh, what we want in the end. So one of the best ways to, to get to where we want and, and hit the, the point we want is to use diminishing returns. And why would we do that? So there, there's several reasons, and uh, they all combine. Diminishing returns, as it is defined, is uh, you continually put in more effort to get smaller reward, right? So that's that's what we want. Uh, you'll find examples in, if you've played especially MMOs, but lots of role-playing games and other games where you level up, your first session, uh, you may level up four or five times, in like a half an hour. Like, wow, it's just cruising right along. And to level up the from level 20 to 21 may take you a month, right? So you've put in a month's worth of work to get one level, when before your first level you put in five minutes of work to get that level. That's diminishing returns. You put in more and more effort, or you put in more and more money to get a smaller increase in stats or a better weapon. It really applies across the entire board. So uh, that's what diminishing returns is. Now why do we use it? One, it forces the player to use new tactics. So for example, uh, if the player leveled up every 10 experience points and they defeated goblins and goblins gave them one experience point okay so 10 goblins equals a level right easy enough but when I level up I get stuff I get better weapons uh, I get more attacks I do better damage I'm tougher so now it's easier to to defeat a goblin okay so now it's less effort to get to level 2 because goblins are a little bit easier and if I'm all the way up at level 30 gob goblins are trivial and killing 10 goblins and defeating them and getting the experience to get to level 31 is absolutely trivial. We have now swung all the way to the boredom side uh, because they found a, a degenerate strategy, and this comes inherently with flat balance games, is there's a degenerate strategy in defeating the easiest thing repetitively. You may have seen this, especially in some older games, where you, you grind, right? You find something simple, and you just grind on it, grind on it, grind on it, instead of advancing to the next thing. Uh, now, if that was diminishing returns, and, uh, you know, goblins give you one experience point, but to get to level 30, from 30 to 31, is 10,000 experience, you're never going to get there with goblins. So you give up on goblins, and you go fight dragons, because they're worth 5,000, uh, whatever, you know. So the point is, one of the things that diminishing returns does is it forces the player to use uh, new tactics. The next thing... Uh, let's players advance quickly at first. Now, why would we want to do that? I mean, like I just said, first uh, session you advance five times. That feels good to players and gets players engaged. Levels to us as creators are free. They're endless. We can have as many levels as we want of leveling up experience points, uh, better weapons. It's just numbers to us. But to players, there's psychology involved. And this is where we go back to psychology and mathematics combining in systems. Players like to level up. They like to hear ding. They like to see stars. They like to see fireworks uh, and see that number go up. They just do. This has been a psychological uh, phenomenon that's been established very clearly. Uh, so if we let players level up a lot at first, then uh, they're going to be more engaged and like our game better. So it's, a, it's kind of a cheesy tactic, but it works. So there's no need to fight it. 
Uh, the next thing it does is stretches out late content. If we continued the pace of leveling up, because players like to level up, but if we continued that pace, uh, we couldn't keep up with it. The numbers would get high, really, really high, really fast. Uh, if they leveled up five times every session, uh, their levels would quickly get into the hundreds and uh, become meaningless. So what we want is at the beginning, you put in some effort, you get a reward. In the end, you're invested in the game or late in the game. We know you're invested in the game. We know you like it. Uh, we know you want to come back already because you've told us that through your repeated visits. So now we can stretch out rewards. We can stretch out new content over longer and longer periods. And this is okay. Players might, don't generally mind this. Uh, there always comes a point where it can be too long, too much for people, and they back off. Uh, but that's something we can tune later. But knowing we're going to have quicker advancement in the beginning, or quicker earning of money, or quicker earning of new equipment, or race tracks, or spaceships, or whatever, uh, is the key component. Uh, the next thing it does in multiplayer games, uh, especially cooperative, but also competitive, is it keeps players of dip, disparate skill closer. Uh, if you're 100 points ahead of me and you're 10 levels ahead of me and you're 10 times my power, we can't really play together. Uh, it's an unfair advantage. But if you're 100 points ahead of me, but that's only one level because it takes so much longer to get to that next level, then we can play together. Uh, and you, you notice this certainly in MMOs. This is, is very clearly illustrated in MMOs where at first players level up really fast and then later on, uh, they level up slowly, and you get behind. If you get behind someone, you can catch up within a level or two of them. That's not so hard, but catching up and surpassing them is extremely hard as those levels slow down. So with the diminishing returns, they're getting less in return for their advancement, and uh, you're getting closer in absolute ability to that other character while you're still quite a ways away in uh, measured uh, achievement. And this also illustrates player advancement clearly. Like all the things we've, we've just discussed, it shows the player that they're advancing, and uh, as the player gets more acclimated to the game, they're used to the smaller increments of advancement. Now, how do we get to getting these top-down diminishing returns to work? So we're going to talk about curves, and we're going to talk about top-down curves. So you worked in the, the first couple weeks, you, you built an ex experience curve, from the bottom up. Remember there were skeletons, we knew there were this many in this level and some in another, and then you had to backwards evaluate, well how do we adjust things so that we adjust our curve to the amount of uh, battles we're going to be doing. Right? That's the, bo uh, the bottom up version. We're going to do a top down where it says we're the system designer, we're day one on the project, nothing's been made, but we're planning out how we're going to make our game. And so we want to, to build some things uh, using diminishing returns uh, into a curve so that our macro systems can better instruct how the game as a whole has been made. Now, what are the, some of the usages? Level increase, like we've talked about a lot. Health increase, you know, the player gets more health as they go up and do things. Skill advancement, uh, getting new weapons, armor, equipment. You know, every game you've ever played, right, there's the cheap sword. It costs a few uh, pennies, and then there's the ridiculous sword, and then the ridiculous sword that's a little bit better than that, uh, but it costs ten times as much, right? So uh, calculate. how do we calculate those weapon costs? We use top-down curves. You know, it's, it's not a coincidence that in all of the games you've played, uh, you are at the right place at the right time. You have just the right equipment for that boss, he has just the right hit points, amount of hit points to be challenging. All of that, when you boil it down, all comes down to this basic methodology. And we can use this for, you name it, we can use uh, a curve like a top-down curve to uh, instruct us on almost any, any system that advances. Okay, so what are the components of a basic top-down curve? Now, there are as many different kinds of top-down curves as there are games. So you're going to find a multitude of variants of this in different studios, different games, different genres. Genres like to do things differently. Uh, for our purposes, I'm going to give you, I've worked on many genres myself, and I've worked with many, many other systems designers, who, and we've worked on hundreds of games combined. And in talking with everybody, we've come up with, a, I've come up with a system 
and worked with other people to come up with this, this system that uh, this is a basic system that will cover the vast majority of all the top-down curves you will ever need to make. You will need to make exceptions for some things sometimes, but if you start with a curve, if you don't know what to do, like, you know, we got to make equipment cost. How do we do it? Start, you can start with this. It's a good baseline, and then you can purposely deviate if you need it. So there are three variables, only three variables needed to build this system. An initial value, a growth multiplier, and a growth additive. Now, you notice the multiplier and additive, uh, that's pretty much my calling card. Uh, that's one of the things I build into all the systems I build, and I, I profess for everyone to use this methodology uh, because it gives you a lot of flexibility, a whole lot of flexibility and tuning while only involving two variables. Uh, the fewer knobs you can tune to get the more flexibility, uh, the more powerful your system is and the easier it is to comprehend. Uh, once I show you this system, you're going to be able to go look at lots of other systems in lots and lots of games and pretty easily comprehend what they're getting at, what they're going for, and uh, how you could use that system or build a system similar. All right? So why, why each of these variables? So the in, init gives us a non-zero. So your initial value gives you a non-zero starting point. Uh, for a, a good example of this is we don't want any weapon to be free, right? And in Cut the Rope, there is no level that is uh, only the initial level that is zero to unlock. You know, the first level you unlock has a cost. Every weapon has a, a gold value, right? Every new skill you gain has some experience point cost, right? So we want an initial value. Uh, the other thing, reason we do this is that uh, if you have things that are zero, if you start a, a curve or any mathematical formula at zero, you can't divide. And if you multiply by it, you end up with zero. All you can do is add. Uh, so we get more flexibility uh, being able to divide and multiply when we have a non-zero number. Uh, so the multiplier gives us an exponential growth. Exponential growth is what gives us diminishing returns. Exponential growth and diminishing returns are uh, walk hand in hand with each other. So if we have exponential growth of cost, we have diminishing returns of purchasing power. If we have exponential growth of level requirement, then we have diminishing returns of experience uh, acquisition. So uh, this is when we talked about, oh, we, we talked pretty thoroughly uh, about diminishing returns. This is how we get our diminishing returns. Now, additive corrects one problem with straight multipliers, and we're going to go over that in just a second. Uh, it gives us more growth at the low levels, uh, and that's because there are, are problems with absolute uh, numbers, and there are problems with fractions that we went over last week. Remember, we talked about Showing a player you have 10.23587 experience points is awful, and we don't want to show them that. Uh, so the additive is one way to get around that. It's also, there's another trick we can do with it. So I'm going to show you, here's a chart without the additive. And here's our values. Our initial value is 10. Our multiplier is 1.020. That's a 2% multiplier, uh, which is a pretty standard game multiplier, and I recommend if you're trying to balance a role-playing action uh, or shooter or other game, start with 2%, uh, and that's just experience. I've done, I've done this long enough to know that 2% is a good place to start to get you a nice, a nice gentle curve. Um, more hardcore games will have higher, more casual games will have even lower, uh, and then for our, our experience here, we're going to go with an additive of 0. So what does that get us? Our initial value is 10, and then to increase one time, 10.2, ugh, what is that? That's why we've already broken our rule of not using fractions and decimals. And if we round this off to make it clean for the player, it's repetitive. 10, 10, 11, 11. There's just no increase here. It's not going up. Now, eventually, yeah, oops, sorry. Eventually, the, the multiplier will kick in because this is geometric curve. So that 2% is going to end up being hundreds or thousands eventually. But it takes a long time to get there, and uh, we need to uh, onboard our players and get them excited about the game and get them, getting them excited about repetitive small number increases uh, is very difficult to do, if not impossible. So, all right, so that's why we need the additive. Now, why do we need the multiplier? Okay, this one's a little bit more straightforward. So we, we flatten out the multiplier to 1.0. 
there is no multiplier. We just add. So every 10, 20, 30, very clean, very straightforward. This is the kind of thing you would see in a tabletop strategy game from the 60s and 1970s. You know, very straightforward, very easy to calculate. You could do this on paper, but there's that problem again of there is no diminishing returns. There is no exponential growth here. So if this was levels and I go up at 30, I go up at 40, I go up at 50, uh, all I have to do is, like that problem I already discussed, grind something that's uh, one experience, two experience, whatever, and now I can. it gets easier and easier and easier for me uh, as I increase my abilities through advancement, but the challenge doesn't get harder. So we need, we need the multiplier. Okay, so now we have both. See, we have our nice gentle curve again, but still going exponential. And now, even at the very beginning, it's big, significant numbers that a player can understand. Oh, yeah, sword number two costs 31. Sword number one costs 20. All right, that's time and a half. You know, that's expensive. Not so much in absolute. It's only 11. But uh, in relative value, if I'm only earning one or two gold pieces and I'm trying to earn that new sword, that's a lot. Uh, but then up here, the exponent kicks back in. And so the additive isn't nearly uh, what's adding to the curve. The exponent is. So now we have the best of both worlds. We have a nice, steady, understandable visual increase for the player here at the beginning uh, that's eventually being faded out and overshadowed by the exponential growth, which is causing our diminishing returns. So we get both things. Smooth, clear, understandable, uh, early ramp, and then big, Diminishing returns, late ramp. Okay. So, and then, oh, sorry, one more thing is our init value. So, this is like a very low init value. So, your time and a half for the beginning. Maybe that's a problem. If we're only earning one coin at a time, maybe that's a big deal. Uh, we don't want time and a half to go up from level one to two. So, how do we fix that? We modify the init value. So, here, uh, again, we're only off by 12. It's only 12 difference. But it's 12 uh, difference out of 112. So that's only a few percentage points difference, whereas the other was 150 percentage points. Uh, so now we've uh, hidden, and we want to make this even more gentle. So this, it, it depends on what kind of game you want. This would be like, say, you were trying to buy a house, right? So all houses are expensive. They start expensive. Uh, but a little bit better house isn't that much more expensive than a base house, right? So this is something with a big initial value that you want uh, a gentle curve. Notice curve is literally identical. Uh, just a little bit offset on the picture, but the curve is identical. Uh, it goes up at the same rate, uh, but it ends in a different place uh, only because of the initial value. Okay, so this would be a good place to pause the video if you're struggling with a few particular questions on a test this week. So I'm going to go ahead and stop right here. Okay, and if you pause the video, you can look at all the formulas. I'm just going to go ahead and expose them to you. So these are our values that you input over here on the right. Your three, and this is all you need is these three. And then you have your init, see, it, it points over here. And then just one formula, uh, we do the, the formula that we, we discussed, is we multiply by the multiplier, then they add the additive, and then we simply round it and drag down. Note that the dollar sign here means absolute reference, means we always want to point to G2 and G3. Or sorry, yeah, G2 and G3. Yep. And so if you type in these formulas and drag them down, then any changes you make here will be reflected in your entire uh, formula set, and all your numbers will be updated. And by tweaking these three numbers, you can make an infinite amount of curves. Uh, if you want a really hardcore game, you bump up the multiplier. Uh, if you want a game where it's a fairly standard pace with not much diminishing returns, you bump up the additive and reduce the multiplier. Uh, if you have, like we said, things that are always expensive, but then increase slowly over time, you bump up the initial value. You can adjust any one of these to get uh, a, a wide multitude of effects. In fact, so much so that if you take a game and you take any subsystem of it and you put the formulas 
in a spreadsheet like this and look at the curve, you, you can have, get an idea of what kind of game you're playing. Uh, for example, if I saw a very steep curve where this is, does like the hockey stick shape and then straight up, uh, that's almost certainly an, an old school arcade game because that's how they were balanced. They didn't want you to play the game longer than a few minutes because they wanted another quarter. So every level, things would get exponentially harder much faster. Now, if the, the goal of your game is like you've paid your, your $60, $70 to get your movie game, it might be almost flat because they just want you to keep playing on through. Or an educational game, even more so. It might be completely flat because they want you to complete that game. So just looking at a curve and looking at the system, you can get an idea of what kind of game it is. Okay, now that we have our curves and we've got them in uh, and we, we're playing our game, so we've planned out all of our systems, we've made a curve for gold and experience and spaceships and orcs and goblins, we've got all of our curves and uh, we've used all of our stats that, from last week that we talked about with inputting the data and we planned it all out, and there they are. They're great. Uh, okay, things don't come out right. That's the way things are. If things come out mathematically perfectly, players will feel that, and it's going to feel uh, very very mechanical, very uh, mathematical. I'm sure everybody's played, uh, usually mobile games are the, the worst at this, where you can predict, like, oh, I have to plant this many pumpkins and reap them at this amount of time, to get this flower pot. Ugh, you know, that's just chores. It's not even a game at that point. Uh, and to counter that, we throw in interesting things. Uh, we throw in bosses with different effects and uh, race cars that can do different things or go different places or terrain that behaves weird uh, as opposed to everything. And all those things, while they're great and they're interesting to players, as macro systems designers, they throw off our balance and we can't calculate for them. All right, so now we need to readjust. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Uh, and we're going to go through each one of these one at a time. But this is an overview of the basic ways. There's a lot of different ways to do it. And often you do these in combination. Uh, but for our sake, I want to talk about these because these are the big ones to really know and understand what they mean and when to apply them and what the pros and cons of each are. All right, so none. Uh, this is a flat balance game. So for example, we're going to take uh, basketball, and we're going to take specifically the three-point line uh, as an example. Uh, if, if there's anyone out there who doesn't know anything about basketball, you throw a ball, try to get it through a hoop, you get two points. If you're outside a line, you get three points, okay? Uh, so most sports games have what's called a flat balance. It doesn't matter how good one team is doing or the other team is doing, that three-point line is always three points. If you're up by 100, three points. If you're down by 100, three points. If you're tied, three points. Every team uh, all play the same. It's flat balanced. This is what most sports are. Uh, and this is also what a lot of one-off games are. Uh, because if there's no campaign in between, if there's no macro game, you really don't need balancing. You reset, you start over, you try again. Uh, it's very easy to implement. Uh, flat balancing because there's nothing to implement. You just put in the rules, make sure they're fair, and you're done. That is literally fair and completely balanced as long as your rules uh, are, are fair and balanced uh, because there is no balancing. The problem is this is very unforgiving to struggling players and it makes the game feel very static and repetitive. So if we're playing a single game where we want to progress, uh, if every gobble, every monster you ever fought was worth one experience point, uh, that would get boring. So we want to advance and we want to adjust things. So uh, the flat balancing doesn't allow for that. Next up is a, the positive feedback loop, otherwise known as the rich get richer or the poor get poorer. Uh, a real-world example of this, because I like to give both real-world and video game examples, is bowling. So you may... If you don't understand bowling, to explain it quickly, uh, in bowling, you throw the ball at most 12 times. And you add up all the pins, you knock down. So it's between 0 and 120 pins is how many pins you can knock down. You get a, a bunch of tries to knock down the pins, right? 10 frames plus 2 extra. Uh, 
Uh, however, scores don't go from 0 to 120. They go from 0 to 300. Because the better you do at bowling, the better your score is. And it's a cyclical loop. You do better, your score gets better. You do better, your score gets better. All right? So in poker tournaments, this is an even there's even more of a vicious positive feedback loop. The more money you have as a poker player, the more ability you have to call someone's bluff or to force someone out or to force someone into a tough decision of sacrificing more of their chips. Uh, so the richer you are, the more powerful you become as a player. And what that means is the better you do, the easier it is for you to do better. And the easier it is for you to do better, the better you do. And this very often illustrates itself in poker tournaments where somebody gets out to an early lead and they cruise all the way to the end. Uh, the, the board game Monopoly is another one. Get a few good rolls in the beginning, and that makes the game easier, which gives you more opportunity to better, and then you win the game. Uh, I'll get to that. <laughs> so one of the good things about it is it exaggerates... Oh, you think you're kidding. Uh, exaggerate small differences in ability. So, uh, and this is why I suspect, I do not know who designed the, the scoring and bowling, but uh, I suspect that they used that scoring method because 0 to 120 with players often winning by one or two pins uh, gets boring. They want it more exciting, and by exaggerating uh, good and pun severely punishingly bad, uh, you exaggerate the highs and the lows, adding in excitement. Uh, I can also add in frustration. Uh, because if you're on the poor side of that, and let's go back to our, our basketball example. So let's say if you're ahead when you're playing basketball, the three-point line becomes a four-point line. If you're very, very far ahead, it's a five-point line, six-point line, seven-point line. Uh, conversely, if you're behind and they're beating you, the other team is beating you, uh, it becomes a two-point line, a one-point line, a half-point line. Uh, you know what? I think very obviously people can see what would, that would do to the game of basketball. First team to get up would get up even further and even further. The team was lower, get even lower, and you could determine the game within the first few minutes. Uh, it's a feedback loop, and whoever gets off to that good start is just going to win. Uh, so that's not a good thing in a game like that. Uh, in bowling, it's perfectly acceptable, and we like we like it. In basketball, it would be completely unacceptable. Uh, we do this thing sometimes in, in video games because we need to uh, a resolution, right? A tug of war is a good example. Uh, a tug of war could go on for hours or days if people are equally matched. So if we wanted to add a pa positive feedback loop, we'd say for every inch you went towards your side, you get to add a person, right? Just to get it over with. Uh, you know that that's a, an example of a positive feedback loop, and the reason we use it. Uh, on the other hand, they're really easy to implement. All you have to do is give people rewards for winning and punishers for losing, and you have a positive feedback loop. Uh, and the, the greater the reward you give for winning, the bigger the loop. The bigger the punisher for losing, uh, the bigger the loop. And, yeah, someone in chat here mentioned this looks like American politics. Uh, you are actually exactly correct. This is the way capitalist systems work. The richer you are, the more money you have the more ability you to have the money. All you have to do to look at this quantified is look at interest rates. If you're poor and borrow, you're losing money at an interest rate. Uh, if you're rich and loan, you're gaining money at an interest rate. So you're giving, people are giving you money because you have money and taking money away from you because you have no money. So that's uh, exactly a positive feedback loop. And a lot of people would say it can be very frustrating when players are on the poor side. Now, let's go to the opposite and look at a negative feedback loop. This is called rubber banding, uh, often. And most racing games, in particular kart racers, have it. So if you've ever been in front and hit with a blue spiky shell when all you can get is banana peels, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, that is uh, a rubber banded method and is uh, a negative feedback loop. Uh, handicapping in golf. Uh, there's a method in golf, if there are anybody out there who plays go golf, if not, I'll explain it slightly, uh, is you take your average number of times it takes you to hit the ball and get it in the hole. And then that average is then compared to your current day. Uh, I believe it's subtracted from. Uh, but 
it becomes a comparison between your averages of you and the other player. So a very good player would have uh, a penalty, and a very bad player would get a reward to make it a competitive match between those two players on that day. Uh, one of the benefits of doing a negative feedback, oh, and oh sorry, I want to cover my, my basketball analogy too. So conversely, let's say when you're behind in basketball, uh, the three-point line becomes a four, five, six, seven, etc. And when you're ahead, it reduces down to nothing. Okay, what, what does this mean? It means that uh, the games are probably going to be a lot closer, uh, that it's easy to catch up, it's easy to surpass, but it's not easy to keep the lead. And the lead will go back and forth. This makes for very exciting games, and that's exactly why they do it in kart racers. It's also fairly easy to implement. Uh, all you have to do is think counterintuitively to capitalism. <laughs> you know, when somebody makes a mistake, you give them a reward. And <laughs> when they do well, you punish them. That is a negative feedback loop. Uh, now, what's the, the, the negative of this? Uh, it makes a lot of close outcomes where maybe there shouldn't be. It makes players who are doing well, like if you're that guy who can only get banana peels and you hit by a blue shell, uh, you felt the sting of, uh, of uh, socialism, <laughs> you know, well, I, I deserve to do better, right? And that's a, a pretty natural feeling, especially in multiplayer games. Now, this is definitely not the case in single-player games because uh, we'll get to this a little bit later, but players don't like balanced single-player games. Next is DDA. Uh, this is short for Dynamic Difficulty Adjustment. This is something that is, I think, unique to video games. If there is an analog version of it, I don't know. Uh, let's say in our basketball analogy, DDA would be, we notice that uh, Bobby has thrown from the three-point line ten times and missed. Okay, so we're going to re reduce uh, the, the diameter of the three-point line. So Bobby can move up closer and shoot and get his three-point. Uh, okay, great. So now Bobby nailed it three times in a row. Uh-oh. Okay, it's getting too easy. We're going to increase the diameter of the three-point line. Uh, now, we can't actually do that physically. We don't do that. Someone would have to run out with tape uh, or paint it on or something, right? And we don't do that. But in video games, we do that behind the scenes. Now, where do they do that? Action games, very often, have you ever, if you've ever gotten to a boss and the boss is just like impossible, can't do it, you fight it, you fight it, you fight, and then you win. You're like, wait a minute, that seemed way easier that time. Did I really get better or was it just easier? Uh, probably it was just easier if it's a modern game. If it's an old game, you got better. Uh, the other place they do it is in freemium games. There's nothing that freemium uh, games want less than for the player to put their game down and not pick it up again. And so if they're struggling with anything, they're going to boost them through it. They will figure out. So, you know, take any freemium game, especially like the card collecting ones on mobile. Uh, you, you play and you lose and you lose another thing, and you don't complete, they're going to give you, all of a sudden, you got a free magic chest with everything you need to complete the next level. That's DDA. Uh, the, the benefits of it is that it gives players a consistent experience. So if you want everybody to take 10 hours to complete your game, and you want them to complete the game, uh, that's very difficult to do because players' skill level is incredibly disparate. But if you secretly behind the scenes cheat and say, uh-oh, it's taking you too long, Let's uh, bump up your ability, or you're, you're cruising through this, so let's increase the difficulty. Uh, that's DDA. Uh, and also, is it adds significant scope. These are not easy things to implement, to detect when the player is in specific conditions, and then dynamically adjust things behind the scenes and make sure that that's tested. These are incredibly difficult systems, and they pretty much shoot all those curves that we've shown. Yeah, DD is totally a dirty trick, uh, but players kind of like being dirty tricked. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Next up is layered difficulty, uh, or player choice difficulty. So if you remember back in the 80s and 90s, 90s in particular, where you'd boot up a game and it's like, do you want to play on easy mode, hard mode, or ridiculous mode? That's layered difficulty. That's just saying, uh, tell, ask the player, well, how hard do you want the game to be? Yeah, all right, cool. That's how hard the game will be. Uh, next up is a beautiful example. I recommend everybody play Star Fox uh, to learn layered difficulty, if nothing else. It's a great game anyway. You notice I'm not calling out very many games specifically by name. 
I'm going to call out Star Fox because uh, it is such a beautiful example. In Star Fox 64, uh, I haven't played the, the, the brand new one yet, but in Star Fox 64, if you beat a level, you survived it, but just barely, it moved you to an easy level, an easier level. You still progressed forward, but it was an easier version. If you did it and you did pretty well, you moved to a standard one. And if you really tore it up, it moved you to a more difficult level. And as long as you were really uh, doing well, you stayed at the highest difficulty level. But as soon as you uh, didn't do so well, it dropped you down. And so the player is, and actually gave you some choice too. Would you like to go to the easier level? Uh, the hard level is unlocked, but we'll give you the easy and the medium. So the player is getting to choose their difficulty based on their performance. Uh, so that's great. Uh, the next up is like RPGs, uh, big RPGs like Skyrim, MMOs. They, they do it by a geographic location. So you know the giant monsters are over in the north, and they're going to tear you up if you go over there. And you know the noob area is in the south, so if you just want to go grind, you go there. It's your choice as a player of what kind of uh, difficulty you want. Now the, the positive of this is it lets the player dictate. Maybe you have a player that likes being frustrated, and they want to go in the hardest difficulty, and they don't mind replaying and restarting over and over and over again. Uh, DDA forces them into your play style. Layered difficulty allows them to choose. Uh, and vice versa is the same. If I just want to cruise through the game, I want to play with my five-year-old, I don't want to challenge, I don't want to be defeated, I don't want him to cry, I just want to get through the game. Right? So uh, having that option gives the players a lot of choice. On the other hand, uh, it, it requires a tremendous amount of design work. Uh, unless you're just doing a simple multiplier, easy, medium, hard mode, uh, anything like Star Fox or the RPGs that we talked about, you're often creating many, many times as much uh, content as the player will ever see. So, you know, think about it. if you've played uh, Skyrim or Fallout 4 or one of the other big ones, you've only seen a fraction of the content. And all the rest of that content is wasted on you. They spent all those years developing it. You bought it. You paid for it with your hard-earned dollars, and yet you don't get to see it. Uh, so that can be a problem. Maybe that's not a problem. If you're a Bethesda-sized company and you got the budget, not a problem. If you're a Blizzard-sized company and you're making WoW, not a problem. If you're a small indie company and you're making a mobile game and you have barely enough budget to feed yourself, that's a problem. You need to make sure the player can see all your content. So uh, I do really like, okay, you did every quest in Oblivion. Good for you. I did a lot of them too, but you didn't see everything. There's just too much to see uh, from our chat group. Okay, next up is cross-feeding. Now this is one that uh, I haven't seen labeled this way before, so I coined this term several years ago, and it's one that... Uh, it allows players to make up for weak areas with their strengths. For example, let's say you have a game that has combat and it has finding secret items. So you can look through nooks and crannies and you can find health packs and power-ups and recharges and cool weapons, right? Or you can run right through the center and kill everything. Uh, if you're good at combat and you don't like collecting, then you're fine. You, you just tear right through. You don't need the health packs because you're good at this. Uh, you don't need the bonus weapons. And in particular, if maybe you, you perform extra good at combat, the enemies you defeat give you extra good rewards. So that way you really don't need to search for anything. On the other hand, if you're the kind of player that isn't very good at combat, but you do like the game, and you like searching through every nook and cranny, you can also play this game. And it's also balanced for you. You get to a combat scenario, it's like, whoa, that's way too tough for me. So I'm going to spend the next half an hour searching every nook and cranny, getting all the power-ups, and I'll come back, and then I'll get it. Uh, you know, the, it's the same game played from two completely different perspectives and, and played equally. Now, the, I think the cross-feeding is great uh, because it allows multi, multiple different player types to play the same game and have a great experience, but not the same experience. And it allows the same person who's <clears throat> prolific at both, uh, or any number of systems, uh, to go back through and play different ways. But it is very difficult to design, design and make sure each one of your player types, instead of doing testing once, 
You're now testing for each player type and in each extreme and making sure one isn't more balanced than the other. Uh, this is a, a real typical MMO problem. They're like, oh, the way I play is a combat guy, and everybody knows that the game designers like the, the collectors better. Uh, and then the collecting people will say, well, yeah, I like to collect, but I'm not very good combat. And everybody knows that the people who are combat guys, they do better. And, like, you'll get constant streams of complaints. Uh, because if there's two ways to do, do things, players always feel that the way they don't do them is the way that is unfair and totally cheating. Everyone loves to complain. Okay, now balancing, I've been ambiguous this entire time, whether I'm talking about single player or uh, multiplayer games, in particular versus, because multiplayer co-op and single player, uh, while they have some differences in systems-wide balancing, they tend to be fairly similar. Uh, where they vary widely is multiplayer versus games. Single player games are usually unfair, and players like it that way. Uh, for example, in Mario, you play one character with one hit point, and you go through an entire kingdom killing everything in your sight. Hundreds, if not thousands, of victims. Uh, in a balanced game, you would lose each one of those battles each time, or half of the time, right? Because it would be balanced. Uh, what a horrible game that would be. Think about your favorite shooter, uh, the number of bullets it takes to kill your enemy, versus the number of bullets it takes to kill you. Now, this is really ridiculous in most games. You know, it's, often it's like 100 to 1. Uh, you know, you, you can take 100 bullets for their one, and you're just wiping out scads of these guys. Well, they're human, you're human, they're all human. Why is it that uh, you're so impervious to bullets and they're not? It's because players like that it's unfair. <laughs> they like to be the star. Uh, not everybody gets to feel like they're the star all the time. In their life, not everybody feels like every the world is unbalanced in their favor. And once in a while, it's really fun to feel like the world is totally unbalanced in your favor. Uh, so much so that often players even forget that uh, Christopher, if you could hold your question to the end, please just write it down and then ask me afterward. We'll, we'll get to it. Uh, players even forget that the game is unfair in their favor. And uh, to, to illustrate this example, I'm going to tell you one of my favorite anecdotes. Uh, and if Hopefully everybody has seen the movie Austin Powers, uh, the very first one. So there's a scene in the movie Austin Powers where uh, Dr. Evil, uh, who's the big bad guy, has captured Austin Powers, and he's going to kill him. And his son, Scott Evil, says, all right, well, I'll get my gun. We'll just shoot him. And Dr. Evil says, no, no, no. We're going to put him in this room with a single guard on a platform over water with sharks with lasers on their head, right? And what are we thinking as the audience? That's ridiculous. We know Austin's going to get loose, right? We know that, right? Uh, there's no way. And where Scott Evil's like, no, we'll just, we'll just kill him right now, right? That's fair balancing. <laughs> you, know, you got someone caught, you got a gun, you kill him, done. It's over. Uh, but the way we do it as, as video game designers is we give the illusion that it is un, the odds are unfairly stacked against us when in reality we know as players we have been Austin Powers this whole time. We know we're going to get out, we're going to get out of the sharks uh, and, and get loose, and they're not going to just shoot us in the head. So that's the big difference in, in single player of, of balancing difficulty. Now, the, the difference in multiplayer is that you have humans who need to feel that it's fair for them. One of the easiest way to get your multiplayer versus game trashed and hated is for players to feel there is a legitimate cheat, not an unfair balance, but like an actual cheat that someone else is able to cheat against them and have a truly unfair balance. Uh, players absolutely hate that and will abandon your game. So what would be balanced in a single player game would be completely broken uh, in a multiplayer game. And what would be balanced in a multiplayer game generally would be considered not fun and very frustrating. That's Scott Powers in your single player game. Okay, so now we've got all that stuff in. We've built our curves. We've done our, our difficulty adjustment. And we have players playing the game. Now, how do we know that it's working? We do analytics. Uh, back in the old days, we would sit with a clipboard 
and watch players play our game. Uh, now we can actually have the internet tell us how it's going. So we gather data from live games uh, that are going, hopefully hundreds or thousands or even millions of instances, and then we uh, we put that data in a graph and we interpret information from it uh, from the data and we look for patterns and we look for spikes of difficulty you know if you have um, one enemy that uh, everybody is quitting after they they start playing this enemy uh, okay yeah that, that's a data anomaly that we want to investigate and we can detect where players confused you know third menu in the the third screen in the instructions menu everybody quits Okay, there's probably something wrong with that. Let's check that out. Uh, what we're looking for when we do analytics is smoke. You know, where there's smoke, there's fire. And we're looking for smoke. That's really hard to see fires. You know, it, it's often small. It's like looking for, uh, you know, a campfire from the air. Right? You have this huge view of a forest. And where are the campers? Well, we look for the smoke to find them, right, because they're hidden amongst the trees. Very much the, the same way uh, that, that uh, data anomalies are with analytics. So one thing we can do, for example, uh, hint, hint, for example, is if we had a chart, uh, a, a data set, and we had levels that we wanted the player to progress through in our online game. And some players quit every level. It's natural. It happens. You're never going to retain 100%. But say we had a whole uh, big barf of data, just a bunch of numbers. Uh, how would we make sense of it? So the method would we use we take that data and we put it in a spreadsheet and we analyze it. So for, this is called a level funnel, is the term used in the industry. You know, starts big, gets little. Uh, how are our players funneled through the game? How many at the start? How many at the end? So if we did a mathematical formula to say, well, how many, level, uh, how many players did we lose, or percentage did we lose this level? And we did that calculation for all levels, then we can look and see, is there an anomaly in there? Is there one level where we're losing more or less? Is there several levels where we're losing more or less? Okay, let's inspect those levels first and see what's going on. Uh, that's the kind of thing you do with analytics. We could teach literally a whole degree about this, uh, but I definitely want to, to just whet your appetite for the, the power of what analytics can do for you. Finally, a few odds and ends. We're almost out of time, and I, I don't want to go so far over like I did last week. Uh, but these are little bits of things that, again, they don't really fit anywhere, but I just want to convey the information to you so you have it rattling around in your brain as you make games. Uh, damage per second. There's uh, young players, new players, new designers even, often get confused when it comes to damage. So if we look at this little chart here, damage. Uh, all these guys do 100 points damage, right? So they're equal, right? Wrong. We can't look at things that simply. So... In our data, we say there's a time delay between attacks. In almost all games, especially real-time games, yeah, but even turn-based games, there is some time delay. They're not instant. They can't attack every frame. Uh, so we have to set that delay. And if they're different, if they're not all the same, uh, then that has a dramatic effect. So even though these all do 100 damage, if there's a two-second delay, that means uh, you can attack half a time per second, right? So your damage per second would be 50. So we see, even though these are equal, they're very much diminishing returns uh, on the damage per second. So to get a game balance, you can't look at just damage. You can't look at just time between attacks. You have to look at damage per second. And that goes with any other related system. Uh, if something does something over time, you have to look at it over time, not just uh, in a single instance because you won't have the right balance you need. Also, this is where waiting comes in too. So uh, another, this is... A very easy one, if you look through a list, okay, this one does 1 damage, 2, 10, 20. Obviously, the guy that does 20 is the most, right? He's the best. Wrong, because this guy attacks very fast. He's actually the best, and the rest are equal, uh, because their attack per second uh, is equal. Now, this is something that if you do analysis of games you play regularly, you'll find little anomalies like this, and this would be called a, a degenerate strategy if I found this. Like, oh, well, why bother using any of these other guys or attacks or whatever? because the DPS on this one is so much higher. Unless we counter counterbalanced it another way, it was more expensive, it was more advanced, uh, it's, a, it's 
less likely chance of, of working, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the point being, uh, you can't look at uh, individual systems in isolation and damage per second is a very uh, good example of why. Last up is a trick uh, that I use. It's called the tension trick. Uh, so using numbers that are easy, not easy to divide creates dissonance in the player. So if I told you uh, you have one second to decide, do you want to go for this, something that does three sixteenths uh, the amount of experience you need or something that is 738s. Oh, geez, I don't know. I have to do the math. Stop. You're confusing me. I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm upset. Uh, that's often a bad thing. But if you want to increase tension and fear uh, and make an emotional roller coaster, uh, then it actually can be a good thing if used in the create uh, right place. This, again, ties back into numbers and emotions. Simple to divide. Like, oh, do you want to do the thing that is 25% of what you need or 26? Oh, that's easy. I know. That's very easy numbers to compare. Uh, but if it's these small slivers of numbers, it gets more difficult. And we can graph this out visually. So we have an example here. A player has a character with 20 hit points. And we know top down, we want the boss to kill the player character in four hits. So the standard way to think of it, the, the, the new designer way to think of it, okay, 20 hit points, 4 hits, 5, right? Yep, easy enough. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, technically that works. But uh, that's the least amount of tension. It's even increments. Uh, and if I, I showed this graphically here. Here's your health bar. Looks like, yeah, yeah, I'm low on health. It's not good. Uh, but this bar looks way more dangerous, way scary. Oh, my goodness, I'm hanging on uh, by the skin of my teeth. Oh, my goodness, even though numerically, I, one more hit, I'm, I'm gone on each. But this one is just bigger than this one. So if we do five, uh, after three hits, there's uh, you have five left. And after four hits, you have zero. But if we do six points damage per, after uh, three hits, you only have two hit points. So it's a tiny amount. And after four, you still have zero because you can't go under. You, you don't go negative, uh, assuming. Most games don't. Uh, so this is a way... You can build in tension or release tension. Either way, uh, if you want to make things calm and easy uh, for the player psychologically to compute, you do nice round numbers. Uh, you do big whole numbers. You do use percent. If you want to create tension and edge of the seat gameplay and nerve wracking decisions, you use difficult to compute numbers. Again, this doesn't really fit in with anything we're, we're doing, but this is a great trick I've learned. I learned it a long time ago and I've used it to great effect and watch people have these edge of seat moments, and I, they didn't even know why, but I knew why, uh, many, many times before, so it's just a trick I wanted to pass along. And finally, let's do some Q&A. I'm going to stop the recording.